just as I go past, I get a uh, in my ear. So I turn around and grab the guy with the jacket and lean them off the bridge. When this is take two, is take two. Like she doesn't even listen to the episodes anymore because. She's like, my daughter is too vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, why are you putting that up? I'm like, fuck's sake, ma. Yeah, like, no, it's just second nature now at this stage for a lot of us. Like, isn't it? It's like, no one bats an eyelid anymore. Do it's you fun. swear a lot as a coach? Yeah, yeah, probably a bit. Yeah, just, just myself a little bit. You know? Yeah, I used to swear so much when I was coaching. Yeah. I used to coach uh, handball and... <laughs> I had kids, like, mm. I had kids and I had to be taken to a side yeah. being like, but... It's different. <laughs> I I thought I was teaching them passion. <laughs> yeah. And like... And they're just going home armed with new <laughs> phrases that they can, uh, they can riff off. As in, I don't know what it is, man, but like, I trust someone more when they swear. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Themselves, yeah. Yeah. That's literally yeah, it. That's guarded. When did you start your coaching practice, actually? Yeah. So, oh, I'm probably doing it. <sighs> on a self-employed basis 20 years and you know kind of maybe a few years even before that so like uh the guts of 25 years um no way. yeah yeah so I'm, before I'm, it was trendy like i'm an old motherfucker now yeah. like I'm, I'm 44 now so i'm sort of getting on a little bit but uh Shit. i've been yeah wor- like i initially just started out working in gyms because i liked I was young and I liked playing football and say and, and playing sports and 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 that was just kind of what I was into. So I was like, oh, this is a natural thing to do. I'll get into this. But then I realised oh, I don't actually like working in gyms because working mm. in gyms is bullshit. What were gyms like twenty years ago? Uh, it wasn't as big and as popular as it is now. Like everybody goes to a gym now. Everybody yeah. looks after themselves. Back then, you were sort of in a in a minority if you did that. You know, was it um, like a garage like? Yeah, no, uh, no, these were like, you know, commercial gyms, like, uh, I remember working in, a, a, a bounce around a couple of different places, hotel gyms, and and then commercial gyms, uh, I was in one of those those big Ben Dunn uh, gyms as well for a little while, and I was, I gravitated into doing like self, being a self-employed uh, one-on-one coach, and then I, I just found the environment just meh, wasn't for me, you're mm. walking around in a, in a, in a, in a, a building that's just packed full of um you know you know people from all walks of life but it was just crazy and and, and chaotic and you you can't get your hands on anything you need like bits of equipment i kind of like to know where everything is i like to be in a situation where there's a bit of order around me i'm like that even at home if my house is a mess i can't get anything fucking done i just need to drop everything put it all back together and then go about my day i need to know where shit is like so I, I kind of just, the natural progression was to just open my own small little gym and it was tiny the first place, but I had built up a good crew of people that I was coaching and they sort of came there with me and then that just sort of grew organically. I upgraded into a bigger place and then mm. moved on to another place after that and um, I've, I've sort of downsized it these days since I became a dad three years ago. I, I've sort of do it now just as a part-time thing. I, I work one or two hours a day tops. No and way. that's yeah so I just have a couple of classes like I, I, I had a couple of PTs this morning um you know some mornings I've two three classes on and like I work a couple of evenings that's it uh the rest that's of the amazing. the rest of the time I um you know it's dad life bit of training and then obviously I do a lot of work with commentary and stuff on on combat sports I have a question to ask you because so I'm 25 right, right. and I feel like there's this um not even theory but there's this idea or piece of advice that's going around which is like work now so that when you become a parent you can enjoy that time Mm. and you just said that like since becoming a dad you've taken a step back and you're still like getting by Mm. is that what you kind of did you just hustled it out for 20 years yeah like before my kids were born like I was in a a bigger facility than I am now I'm actually in the same place but I've I renegotiated the deal I have with them. I use a smaller space in the same building mm. um, and I use it only on a part-time basis. Before that, I had a bigger space. But what I used to do was I'd be in, I'd be working 50, 60 hours a week. Like I'd be there every morning, every evening, good bit during the day too, home for a little snooze in the middle of the day and back to work. And then, you know, that was my hustle and you'd be fitting in some training around that. And then the next thing you know, you've got, like we had, a, we had the first baby came along her birthday's this weekend actually so at the end of january in 2020 and then the world went into lockdown mm. so there was a little time to take stock and go right uh, do i want to go back to doing all of that and just paying a fortune for someone to mind my kid and then i'm a part-time dad yeah or do i want to just downsize the business and 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 let you know uh, i could be at home minding 
my new baby. Then there was another baby to think about as well. It came, the, the second baby came very quick, uh, quickly. So, um, yeah, so it sort of it wasn't, that wasn't the plan, but that's okay. sort of just the way it sort of played out, you know? Yeah. So was it like a somewhat tough decision or not really like an easy decision because you're a parent? Because you became a parent? Uh, it, I suppose, it, yeah, relatively tough, but it felt very important to me to do it because the generate like my generation we were all raised like i come from a single parent family my parents uh, split up when we was very young and my dad moved abroad so i'd see my dad maybe a couple of times a year and of course when you're there it's a single mother and three sisters but when you're being raised by a single mother you don't see her because she has to work every hour under the sun to to feed a, fa a family of kids you know so you're sort of raised by your your friends and your community and that you know yeah so it's like I, I, I've grown up like like that and then you know you're trying to like I'm an, I'm an adult now and I have kids now so I'm formulating a better relationship now with my parents and I have a great relationship with both of them but I'm looking at my kids and I'm thinking I, I don't want that I don't want to be part-time dad mm. I want to be hands-on and I'm very hands-on and I I insist on that and I insist on spending a lot of time with two young girls and I want to I want to. I want them to really know me and trust me growing up and all of that. So I, I, I want to be close and I want to build that bond with them. Whereas, the, like I said, the generation before that wasn't really just a done thing. No, no. Um. So I, I took that into account and I said, I'd rather be, like, I'm not a very financially driven person. Okay. If I have enough money to pay the bills and put food on the table, you're fine. I'm, I'm happy with that. If I, if I'm enjoying my day to day and I'm enjoy, like, I, I've, I've never been the type of person who can be in the same place for eight, ten hours all day and then do it again the next day and then do it again the next day i like to be enjoying what i'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis making money mm. paying the bills being responsible but i like to, i like to prioritize the things that need to be prioritized which is time with my kids growing up because i don't want that to be gone by and then then you're trying to retrospectively build a relationship with them which a lot of parents probably fall into that trap you know yeah exactly and i think it's also just even until they just get into school because yeah. then they're going to be away for a very, like a chunky period of the day. That's it. My, my schedule and my, you know, what I do day to day is going to change then anyway, you know, naturally the same way. Yeah. Like, like I said, I didn't plan this part ahead in advance or too far in advance, but we'll see how, we'll see what happens when that comes, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll readjust at that point and adapt and mm. figure it out as we go along. Figure it out as we go along. Yeah, yeah. So something really interesting happened in your career recently where you went from officiating a lot of jiu-jitsu matches right mm. is match the right word yeah and and i was working as a judge and a referee on mma uh, and uh well i was over basically a five-year window up until last year yeah how did you get into that first of all before we talk about the change how did you become a judge in mma um i've always like i, I love mma you know and i train in the place i, tra I train in team rhino it's a uh, one of the biggest mma teams in the country with mma and jiu-jitsu and stuff and i'm I predominantly do jujitsu, but uh, I've always been like, I, I, I like being in and around the whole scene and, you know, the officiating um, qualification came up. They were running a course for, for judges and refs and stuff. So um, I just went along, it was a few years ago, I went along with a couple of my coaches and we went along and we did it. And then, you know, the, there's not actually many people hands on doing it. They were, they needed a few officials mm -hmm. on, on the, on the team that were, were going to be, um, helping out at some of the events so I was like yeah we can do that no problem next thing you know you're finding yourself with a pen in your cage side and there at the first event and it was it was actually headlined by one of the best fights that's happened that here in Ireland it was Peter Queeley and Declan Dalton it was a bloodbath and I remember just sitting there right Is that Bellator? No this was before, the, before. The, before Peter signed up to Bellator but uh, okay. it, this was on a cage legacy event and I think it was in Drogheda and it was the first event I worked I think as an official but I remember just sitting there at my desk pen and paper there's my phone sitting there and they're beating the brakes off each other a couple of feet from me the cage is here like you could touch it and i'm looking at my phone screen and there's just blood spattered over it. i'm like you're right in the middle of this scene here <laughs> this is this is pretty sick like you know because these are memorable moments like people yeah. are still talking about this fight years later so it's like okay I'd, uh, i'm into this i'd rather be doing this than sitting up there drinking a beer in the in the in the bleachers watching it i want to be yeah right here in the midst of it so and the environment around those shows is really good. Like um, when you rock up to the show, no matter which individual promotion it is, it's the same people working cage side. We're like a family. So you've got the cuts teams, you've got the, the medics, you've got the officials, all, all of the people that are involved in making the show happen. Uh, the commentary team and the ring announcers, which I'm now one of, uh, we're all just really close 
f- friends. We all get on really well together. We turn up. Our work is just really enjoyable. So everyone's just excited to be there. It's a really nice environment it's to paid turn up to. to watch one of your favorite sports. Yeah, like I'm I'm commentating this weekend for the first time. Like I said to you earlier, in five weeks, and I'm I'm fucking pumped. Like I can't wait to go to work. You know, yeah. so it's it's a it's a rarity. You know, like you know, not everyone feels like that about their job. Yeah. And there's there's days where it's a bit more like oh, I have to punch the clock a bit on this one. I'm not as as excited for this one as I am for mm-hmm. that one, but. On the, the bigger picture, it's like you're you're basically you have yeah. to do the little gigs as well in order to do the big gigs. Like can be kind of... yeah, it can be a bit like that. Like and that, they're very rare. There was one or two events I was I, I was in where I don't really know a lot of the people and they're miles away from here. And I'm, ah, this isn't re- it, maybe it's not MMA or Muay Thai. It's it might be mm-hmm. a sort of a kickboxing show that I was less involved, less interested in. But even at that, they're still they still end up being really good nights and stuff. But. Uh, yeah, it's really good fun. But I mean, the main thing you were saying there was, you know, getting into the officiating. I, I, I spent five really enjoyable years operating as part of that officials team. And and you get the chance to, um, it's very high pressure because you can't, you can't fuck up. Like if I, in commentating or ring announcing, which I do now, if I make a little boo-boo, no one cares. But if you're judging a fight and you get something wrong, yeah, people care. They care I was actually going to ask you, have you had a few like confrontations? Like, no, you fucked up in this card. Like. Not really, no. Um, we we were well schooled. Like we did our qu- our our qualifications for judging and refing under Mark Goddard, who's pretty much the number one referee in the UFC. You know, and he, he he's very in depth about how fights should be scored and you know the uh, how they should be officiated and stuff. So we're yeah, we we've always been very tight knit on that. We look we the, the team of officials I worked with very professional. They put the hard yards in and. Uh, we've always done it very, very well. Now you will have fighters and coaches disagreeing with the results. And the main reason for that is that nobody in mixed martial arts understands the scoring criteria. They don't know it. They just Let's explain it. So you've got the, the scoring criteria in mixed martial arts is that there's uh, two primary scoring criteria that, that you look at, and that's uh, effective striking and grappling. Mm. Um, after that, if you can't separate the fighters at the end of the round, when you're supposed to pick a winner of the round and a loser of the round, then you look at the secondary scoring criteria and the third one. But you don't look at those unless there basically nothing else happens. Like if there's no effect of striking or no grappling, then you go and look at the other scoring criteria, like f- aggression and octagon control, like who's pushing the pace. Oh, okay, I see. That stuff doesn't come into play if there's something, if someone has landed more effective shots or if someone has, you know, effectively. Um, or, or has come closer to submitting somebody but people don't seem to understand that mm. they think because their fighter was on the front foot and they're pushing the guy around the cage oh he clearly won that round what the fuck that's a robbery mm. like no you're involved in this sport 20 years you should notice that this is not how this is scored Yeah. and the big reason for it is that when you watch like the UFC um, you've got ex-fighters on there like Daniel Corby yeah, guys that have been amazing fighters but none of them know what the scoring criteria is either they seem to have just a pre pre um preconditioned bias to how you know this is how i always thought fights were scored so therefore this is how they are scored mm. so this the, the drivel that they're spouting on the live stream the general fan thinks oh yeah well that's that's true that must be true if he's saying it yeah. so everybody seems to have just a skewed version there's an emotion in it as well yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so we've had fighters kind of giving a fuck to us like screaming like oh, absolute robbery lads yeah. No, all three of us judges all scored that round the exact same because that's how it should be scored under the, the current scoring criteria. And do you, you may actually, or may not agree with it, but that's yeah. how it goes, you know? And do you watch a match and go like, he one punch landed, one punch landed, grapple? As in like, it like top yeah. up? Lid. You can do. It um, it's basically the effectiveness of the strikes. So if me and you are, 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 are in there and it's a three minute round and you're landing, you know twice as many strikes as I am you don't necessarily win that round you might be just jabbing 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 you mm-hmm. know landing some shots and then I land one or two that caused you to buckle okay so those are effective strikes so do you go like on a scale of one to ten sort of and like not so much but you'd, the damage? you'd always look at what brought you a little closer to winning the fight so if you're popping okay. me with jabs and they're touching me they're touching me and then I hit you with a straight right and your chin flips back yeah Okay, that's for me. That's going to outweigh a handful of okay. fairly accurate jabs. So, are you taking notes throughout the, that three minute round, or not? Really? You can do, yeah, yeah. You can do. I prefer just to keep my eyes on the fight. Okay. You, some judges will be there with a pen and they'll be ticking down. Yeah. I like to have the timer running so I can see what the 
the duration of the round is mm-hmm. and just get a have, a have an idea of right well this guy was you know because sometimes there might not be much effective landed so then you have to start looking at okay who controlled who for a little bit longer okay. that might come into it but i prefer to just look at it and just watch the fighters closely and seeing how what lands but what lands effectively okay what reaction it gets you know if if you're just getting a lot of the shots you're getting touched with they're getting blocked like someone's throwing a big kick and it might look like a big kick it might make a big slap but it's you know it's hitting yeah. your forearm as opposed to landing on your rib cage where okay. it's going to cause some real pain some real damage damage is is a big scoring factor so those are the type of things you're looking for you know and a lot of fighters don't really, or coaches as well, don't really understand that. They think, well, he was clearly landing more shots. And again, it doesn't really matter because he got fucking rocked hard, you know, and he, he could have lost that, re- he could have lost the fight in that round. You know, he just did well to get out of there. So, okay. yeah. So the three minutes ends and then you go like, Debbie won this. Yeah. So the end of the round, it's the, like a name. You've got the 10 point plus score or 10 okay. point must scoring system. So the winner of the round is going to get 10 points. Mm-hmm. The loser of the round is going to get nine points or less. Now they would get less if it was a very dominant round. So you might go 10, eight. Oh, um, if, if they were absolutely knocked down three or four times and almost finished, you might even go 10, seven, but they'll be very, very rare. The most of them are going to be 10, nine. I see. And you, you cannot give a 10, 10. Okay. Technically it's not against the rules for you to do that. But I remember Mark Goddard just told us, he really, really hammered this point home at the at the course. He said, you're there to judge the round. You need to pick. Don't sit on the fence because mm. judges will get lazy. If, they, if, they're, if you're allowed, give them a bit more liberally, you'd see a lot, a lot of 10-10 rounds. Because there's a lot, a lot of close rounds where it's very hard to pick a winner, you know. So you have to pick one or the other. You're there. You have to block out everything else and just focus on what you're looking at and pick that and hand it in at the end of the round and then at the end of the next round you hand in that next card so you can't go back and change your mind because it's already gone and handed over mm. and at the end of the three rounds the uh, the main official then will key out those scores and hand them over and okay we'll see where the chips fall you know yeah P- did paddy bimlet did he win that there are a lot of people screaming blue murder robbery i thought he lost it but when you watch each round individually some of them were a lot closer than you'd think. I thought he lost two of the rounds. I can't specifically remember which two rounds it was. Um, but they were close. And the, the issue is that when each round individually is close, like let's say we have round one, and you, I mean, remember Jared Gordon landed quite a few shots. The, the first one was the clearest one. Mm. Jared Gordon clearly won that. The third round, Jared Gordon was all over him, but didn't really do anything. You know, he was leaning on him, pulling a dragon out of him. I think he might've got him down, but didn't really land much damage. So that, that that then it, it becomes a much closer round than the untrained eye uh, might think. You know, you might be looking at that, oh, well, he was all over him. Yeah, but we're not looking at that. We're looking at damage. what damage was done, nice. what impactful striking, what impactful grappling. He was pulling and dragging out of him and he was all over him, but he didn't really get any closer to submitting him or knocking him out. So now you got to actually pick apart the, how many strikes landed from him. How many stri- So it was really close. And when that happens, the round can be actually scored either way when it's that close. And if you have one or two rounds like that, at the end of the fight, if it doesn't go the way you thought it was going to go, you can't scream robbery because those there was a couple of rounds were razor close. So it's like, mm. really it wasn't a robbery. It's just that under the scoring criteria, those were difficult rounds to, to score. So I could see a, a case where a couple of those rounds, Paddy Pimlet could have dicked. I was surprised that all three judges, uh, or not, no, two of the judges, you know, would have given it a thought. You know, the odds would have been that Gordon would have got the result. Um, what really an- was confusing to me was the first round. I think a couple of judges gave it to Paddy Pimlet, or at least one judge, maybe two. And I thought that that, that was the round where he, he got clocked a little yeah. bit. So it was like, sometimes you'll just get that. where that When that happens, okay, that's just a little bit of bad officiating, which, mm. you know, you can't legislate for. But um, yeah, you'll get fights like that. And there seems to be a lot. Anytime I wake up and I look at Twitter and I scream, this is the worst robbery in UFC history. I'm like... Oh, here I've we go. That. I'm going to be reading over. this all day on my Twitter feed. And mm. yeah, usually it's the case where you watch it back and it's like, no, nobody just, nobody knows how this fight is supposed to be scored. This yeah. is a razor close fight and anything, it could have gone either way. You know? And a lot of people obviously are kind of going on him as not the next Conor McGregor, but like a new character. Mm. Well, he's, he's charismatic. And, he's charismatic. Yeah. The, the haircut, yeah. everything. He stands out and he's he unique out. and... You know, the sport really needs that because they're sanitizing it um, compared to what it used to be. Like they brought in that whole thing where 
you know they all they basically wear a uniform now mm. you know they, they used to just wear whatever the hell they wanted in there they'd have sponsors and blaze it over their shorts they'd have like like anderson silva I had you know you knew it was anderson silva like you know he has his own unique look and now they, they just have you know they all have to wear the same thing it's all very sanitized and they all there's not too many superstars not too many characters it's all starting to become a bit monotonous you know it's like they're just reeling off all these fighters. It's all identikit fighters. And Paddy Pimlet stands out because he just does things differently. You know, he's a bit wild, a bit reckless. And he gets hit. He's in exciting fights, even though he's not fighting anybody who's at a high level. And I think if he did, if he fought That's any of the massive, top 10, like, 15. That's a massive critique of his, actually. Yeah. That they're yeah. like, listen, mate, you're not fighting that big of fighters. I just don't think he's at that level. I think if they yeah. put him in against anyone in the top 10, he gets knocked out. Yeah. And that's like where they need to be careful with him because he is such a good character right now mm, where yeah. he's getting bombs on seats, especially in like UFC in London and all that kind mm. of stuff. People are staying up in Europe to watch the fights in America. Sells whatever. tickets, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, it's money. Would well, you have anything to say about fighter pay and all that kind of stuff? Because I know it's quite a massive topic. Yeah, yeah, those guys... Did you see the slap contest? Oh, it made me sick. I actually caught a clip of it again today. I saw the one where the guy's face is swollen. Did you see the one that fell with his arms like that? Yeah, that just turns my stomach. And talk about a PR own goal after Dana White being caught on camera smacking the face off his missus. And like that guy is just a filthy toe rag. He's sitting there, <laughs> table like next to the to, to the to the stage where they're doing this slap contest and he's losing his shit like this is the best thing ever. It's like, mate, those people are ruined. Like there, Phil Baroni, the the week of the, the Dana White thing. Did you hear about Phil Baroni? Do you know no, that? No, I haven't. Phil Baroni fought in the UFC years ago, you know? And, you know, there would have been a lot of, like, steroid abuse back in those days. He's quite a juiced-up guy. But, you know, guy who's been through a lot of wars and there'd be a lot of, you know, brain trauma and stuff. He murdered his girlfriend. Oh, and his son? Is he no, the guy? Think, That's a WrestleMania was, guy, right? It was a different guy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So Phil Baroni basically um, did a fight with his, I think his missus cheated on him or something and she told him and he basically picked her up and fucking threw her into the shower and she died and, you know, you're going to see more things like this now as a result of this fucking ridiculous slap thing because those guys are just, they're coming out of there with trauma on, the, on, the, on that brain, you know, you're, the human body is not designed to take that shit. Like people look at MMA and they look at ground and pound and, to the untrained eye it's like jesus christ that is visually brutal mm. but the reality of it is as an official we're in there and we're watching these guys are, are defending the throwing shots some shots are getting through some shots are landing as soon as a couple start landing and causing a bit of an issue for the fighter you're watching them like a hawk and if they go down and their eyes roll you're in you're yeah. you're in save that guy get it. get him out of there Stop. you've seen fighters as well like go like he, d- trying to beg the ref to stop the game because they're like, I'm not, I'm going to stop now. Yeah. Like fighters stop. will, they'll quit. Like yes. and they, they won't admit it because it's a, an ego thing and a macho mm-hmm. thing, but there's an unspoken rule, uh, an unspoken thing that goes on in there is a fighter will usually, when you're ref and you'll know a fighter has had enough because he'll turtle up. That's, mm-hmm. that's his signal. That's his body. He might, he, he might be doing it subconsciously. It might not be a, a conscious decision. I just need to get out of here. But if they stop def- um, intelligently defending themselves, which is the the phrase we always use in the rule set, they have to be intelligently defending themselves. That's, That's not really covering up. That's moving, moving, yeah. moving. You're Fighting trying to back. escape that yeah. position. Fuck hitting people back. You're trying to get out of there. You're trying to constantly do the right things technically. But mm. there's a point comes when a fighter has taken a couple of shots and they'll stop doing those things mm. and they'll start doing this. Get him out. Done. Okay. He's done. He saved, yeah. saved him. Live the fight another day. I yeah. see. And as a ref, you have to know you have to know. You can't stand there and, and you know, we'll, we'll usually give them one instruction. We'll say, improve your position. And if if they if they go, let give them a second, see what happens with it. Yeah. But if if you say, improve your position and they take two more shots, whew, done. Mm-hmm. That's that's him just basically quitting. Okay. They're not going to openly admit that they're quitting because no fighter does. But there's always an ejector cord there as a fighter. It's always there. It's a safety uh, net. Just just cover up. Yeah. And the the ref will will step the ref will do his job and he will step in and save you. And lift the fight another day because nobody needs to be taken. It's not life or death. Unanswered shots. So people look at MMA and go, right, that's brutal. That, yeah, but it's not really. They're there and they have they have that. Just do that and it's over. Mm. 
Same with jiu-jitsu. Aren't there less injuries in professional MMA than there is in boxing or something like that? There's a Yeah, like I remember injuries. looking at the, the stats for deaths a few years ago. Yeah. We had an unfortunate situation here, I think six years ago. A fighter by the name of Joe Carvalho died shortly after an MMA bout in Dublin and there was a whole reform since over the safety um, standards involved in MMA and blah, 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 blah. You know, so, you know, we, we have like the highest safety standards of, of any sport, you know. Yeah. But I remember at the time looking into the amount of deaths in other sports statistics. I don't think there had been anyone who had died as a, at an MMA bout or as, yeah. as a re- direct result of one. It had never really happened. And this was an outlier. Mm. And then you're looking at boxing, the, the, the statistics. Now, I don't remember the numbers. This is years ago. But the statistics were mind-blowing. Oh, yeah. Because boxing, you're basically, the head's the main target. In, in MMA, you could be on the ground grappling. Of course, you could take shots to the head. But the, the volume of shots you're taking to the head is nothing in comparison to boxing. Mm-hmm. And when you get knocked down in boxing and your eyes roll and you hit the floor, 10 seconds later, you're back up and you're fighting again. And that's like, hold on, what? He was mm-hmm. just knocked down. Like, if that happens to you in MMA, that ref's in on top of you. So he sees you l- l- rolling back there and your eyes are rolling in your head. You don't get a second go at this, mate. You're done. Yeah. Take it, take three months off here. You're, you're done for a while. Uh, boxing, it's not the case. It's like, no, you're back up. You're back up. Um, now, to be fair, in boxing, what you see a lot more of is you'll see a lot more of corners thrown in the towel. Yes. And the, a lot of boxers are there because they have a, a place in the hierarchy. I'm a journeyman. He's an upcoming pro. I'm here to basically give him a test, but I'm not here to win. You know, okay. I'm getting paid money. This guy is going to the top. I'm not. You know, you're, there, there, there's a bit of a hierarchy there. So as soon as it reaches a point where I'm taking a lot of damage, my corner will throw in a towel. In MMA, no. Let me go out with my shield. Let me, you know, let me do the, you know, okay, let me get the shit beat out of me until I can't take it anymore. I'd rather be dragged out, yeah. You don't want to do a whole lot of that, you know? No. No. You know, it's not not good long term and we circle back to brain trauma and people killing this thing of guys standing there and literally open hand bears of men open hand smacking until like, like two it's or three a of those target. and you're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, like intelligently it's... defending yourself with your hands on a fucking table. It makes me sick to look at it, really does. No. Because it's... I know so many fighters closely and I've been concussed and it's horrendous. It's really, really horrendous. It's really bad. And just to know how that feels and how that affects people and, and, and what damage that can have on their lives going forward mm. turns my stomach to see something like that. And for Dana White, the man who's sitting there making so much money out of fighters and now he's making money out of this shit. It's like, I have yeah. no idea how they actually got a license for that. Yeah. That's the one thing that's so interesting. So I kind of went about on Twitter just to see what the general conversation is. A lot of people are against it in fairness. Yeah. But then there were some that were going like, no, but these athletes are signing up for this. Mm. Like it's been happening. Like it's not like Dana White was asleep and then one day goes, I want to start this sport. He didn't start the sport. It was already happening. But whatever, sure. But I think it's more like, I think people tend to forget that so not so many of us but a lot of people are always hoping for that one opportunity right Mm. and it's like Dana White comes along UFC big box television all the fucking good stuff you're gonna say yes yeah like yeah you can say no like we all have a choice but people tend to forget that power dynamic yeah yeah, and there's this on the line and, you know, that moment of fame, that 15 minutes. and Of course, you don't know. Be swayed. Yeah, do you want to be the Conor McGregor of, like, a slap contest? As in, people are people are making money off of everything now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but, like, no, man, I have no idea how he got a license for that. Yeah, ethically, no it just it doesn't sit right with me at all. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I still see Dana White doing um, whatever he's doing, though. I don't really see a change. He Mark doesn't Francis give a shit. Left yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, devastated about that because whoever goes on and wins that heavyweight title now, it's always going to be like, yeah, but he's not really the heavyweight champion, mm. you know. And the UFC was always like, this was the pinnacle. So you'd be in another organization, but if you were the middleweight champion of the UFC, you were the middleweight champion of the world, and you wouldn't mm-hmm. be referred to as the middleweight champion of the world if you were like the the Bellator or the you know world yeah. championship or anywhere like that. But now it's like, okay, well the best guy is somewhere else mm-hmm. you know yeah and um yeah i think he might have shot himself in the foot he'd, he'd, he he did a very honorable thing and tried to 
you know, get some health insurance and stuff. He tried to negotiate for on the behalf of all the other fighters. Like he's loaded, he doesn't need it, but he tried to bring a lot of things in that would benefit all the other fighters on the roster because the vast majority of them are on the breadline. Health line. insurance is a necessity, yeah. especially if you you're fighting like with UFC with the UFC logo on your shorts. Mm. There should be a level of reputation, nearly prestige. That's it. Well, like they they do it. They their argument is that you're an independent contractor you know we don't need to look after you're a you freelancer you're, like you're a freelance fighter yeah okay. but i can't go off and take x amount of money as a sponsorship from this organization and i can't um. fight in japan no i'm tied to you motherfuckers and if i argue with you i'll be blacklisted you know so it's Fuck. it's like yeah they, they, and then you know you sign a six fight deal but they can just cut you at any time yeah it's in the contract like and they, they can just go ah you know what fuck you we're gone so it's yeah it's very one way you know and the it you know they they have it they have the whole system rigged to their gain. They're not going to change it voluntarily. You know okay. what I mean? No, they're not. France has tried to negotiate and, and a, a few things in the, in the favor of, of you know, uh, the lower level fighters, the guys who are not earning the big bucks. But they just went, right, see you later, Francis. We don't need you. So it's, it's, it's upsetting. It's saddening. But it is what it is, you know? As in, I, I feel like I've learned a lot last year anyways, even just seeing the way Cristiano Ronaldo was dealt with. Mm. And I don't know why, but it kind of like hit me. Probably it's just like a life lesson where I was like, even if a business is not going to kiss Ronaldo's ass, then uh, and they're like, OK, with the biggest one of the biggest stars in the world walking away from all of that, then I see why it's happening elsewhere as well. Mm. Like the money that these athletes have is massive. The money that the businesses have is yeah. unimaginable. Mm. That's it. So seeing that happen, I was like, okay, like I'm starting to understand the way these things work a little bit now, where it's like, you have no say against the business. Like, and I do think like McGregor got a shit ton of money, but he got a shit ton of money from the Floyd Mayweather thing mm. and then from Proper 12 and being the character. He earned that he more got. from those than he ever did from the UFC. Yeah, from the brand. But obviously is run through the UFC, put him in the position to earn of that. Yes, sense. Yeah. yes, exactly. But like it's a one off and he still didn't make it through the UFC. It, it was the platform that he got yeah. and the good character, the um, entertaining character that he was that then it ended up with like the right business decisions at the right time mm -hmm. that got oh, the fucking money that he has fair play to him in fairness um, do you see the PFL kind of competing with UFC or not? I do in the short term, um, short term. can they sustain it is a big thing you know like they're paying out big money now in big-ish money in comparison to other promotions around the world that are not the UFC probably they're trying to get the good fighters in yeah and they're doing it like they're signing up some good names and now they're branching out they've got this European series now that's going to be running through this year and the final of that is here in Dublin which no is way. going to be amazing yeah they announced it last week so when is that 8th of December sexy yeah. so yeah it's going to be quality yeah so they're, they're I'm not sure what way exactly it works I think there's like quarterfinals they'll have X amount of fighters in each weight class fighting and then later in the year there'll be a semi-finals and that'll be an event somewhere else could be London I think and then the final happens in, in December. That's lovely. And that's their flagship event for their European series. Now, they obviously run their their, okay. their series that they do in the US as well. I like the finals concept and all yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully like what will happen is they'll have, I think, is it three or four different divisions? They'll have the, the final of each of those divisions that will be the main card. And you'd presume then the undercard will be opportunities for Irish fighters to mm. come in and get paid and fight in the three arena and stuff. So that's that's a really interesting thing going forward. And the pay is relatively good in comparison. Like they pay more than a lot of promotions out there, you know? Um, yeah, but is that a sustainable business model? Hopefully they can still be here in five and 10 years doing it. It mm -hmm. just remains to be seen, you know? It would be amazing for the fighters as if it was. A lot of fighters still choose to go to, I, I want to go to the UFC rather than go there and get paid more money. Because of the name. I'll go to it because of those three letters, have that on your resume. But there are fighters that have already been there, bought the t-shirt, got released and now oh now i can go off and get fucking paid Shit. and get paid probably three times as much fighting for these guys yeah and you know so the winner of the overall divisions that fight in um 
in their World Series or whatever, when you fight in the States, the winners of each one the mil- gets a million dollars on top of whatever they're getting paid for their fights, you know? Mm. So there's potential there to earn real life change and money for them, which is great to see. Yeah. Because the work these guys put in is insane. They give up everything. I'm surrounded by these guys on a day-to-day basis and it's just, I, I've seen people cut, a teammate of mine cut, he got offered a chance to fight in the UFC a few years ago at a weight class he'd never fought at. He said, look, we've the fight's in 13 days, can you do it? Yeah, go on, I'll do it. 33 fucking pounds he had to cut. And he went in there a shell of himself against one of the highest touted prospects in the world. And he grounded it out for three rounds, but wasn't himself, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, and to witness him cutting weight like that was just... Is it emotional? It was painful, yeah. It was hard to look at, you know? Um, and, you know, I see these sacrifices all the time. I see these guys just for amateur bouts going through not just the weight cuts, but just their lives are on hold. You know, this is what I want to fucking do. Tunnel vision. And, you know, and we're, we're all behind each other. We all help each other out. But people make sacrifices, you know, and it, it'd be nice to see those guys earning good money out of it in the long run and not just coming out of there with nothing at the end, you know, and being treated like dog shit like the UFC tend to do with a lot of yeah. fighters, you know. I see a lot of them are actually kind of getting jobs mostly in gyms. They're getting their personal trainer diplomas. They're kind of sticking around to that field where they're training or they're teaching people to train. Yeah. That's basically it, right? Yeah, because you have a skill set there. I mean, yeah. um, I train I train a bit of Muay Thai once a week and I was just up there today. And some of the fighters there in that gym, they're in there doing private. I like I'm there with my coach, Collie, and then... You know, a couple of the fighters are in there and they're doing privates too in between, you know, because they, they, they would have trained this morning and then they've trained in this evening. So it's a nice way of Non-stop. earning money. You're imparting your skills, you know, mm. shit rolls downhill. You got to keep, keep it flowing. You got to, you got to pass it on a little bit, you know. So it's, um, it's a, it's one way of, of definitely earning money without being tied to a desk, you know, which, which just doesn't suit some people. It takes you know? a lot. Uh, and it also takes a lot of your time, like, mm. and, uh, the one thing that I know anyways, or that I could kind of say is that a lot of companies that are based like nine to five, they pretend or they expect that this job is life or death. Mm. It's like, why aren't we meeting these KPLs? Why aren't we doing oh, yeah. this? I'm like, fucking hell. You sell insurance, fuck off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, stop. It's really not that deep. Yeah, but they really you, make it deep. If you got sick or you died, you'd be replaced in a few days anyway, so. Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but there's, like, a massive surge right now, even with all the, like, tech layoffs and all that. Mm. It's like you're slowly starting to seeing a, see a change again where who knows where the fuck this is going to go, man. Mm. We've got influencers getting paid six-figure deals just to post like about skincare. Oof. But who knows? Anyways, now you're commentating, right? Yeah, yeah. So you had an interesting opportunity where one person walked away, mm. walked away or decided that it's no longer for him. I don't know the details. And you immediately took on the job. Yeah, jumped all over the opportunity. Yeah. Did you, did you always have like your eye on that? No, uh, this, it's only this time last year. So what is it now? End of January. It's February last year. A friend of mine was running a grappling event up in Derry. He was running his first one and it was a big event. Like it was in the cage um, in the afternoon on the day of the big MMA event that was taking place that evening. So okay. he was like, right, I'm going to run and I'm going to bring in some high level grapplers. So it's just jujitsu in the cage, blah, blah, blah. We're going to run a live stream. And initially I was booked to fight on it, compete on it. And then opponent there was a mix up opponent pulled out blah, 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 and he said Look, come up anyway um, we're going to do a live stream will you be the commentator so I was like fucking great yeah I'd love to do that so I went up and um, just sat like this watching the fights the cage is right there in front of me describing the action um, I prepped some notes in advance because I, I knew a lot of the people competing on the show got in contact with anyone I didn't know anything about and I got as much info as I could about them and uh, headset on and just basically relayed right this is who we're watching this is where this guy is very good blah 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 and i found it was just a very very natural fit okay like the guy who sean quirk was running the live stream he said to me jesus that was really good fun how long are you doing this and i said right go oh, like about two hours <laughs> and he was like what the fuck like the, you, okay you just walked in and just did that like it was nothing i said yeah no i felt really i really enjoyed that and afterwards i was thinking I, that was great crack I, and, and I love jujitsu I've been doing jujitsu for so long but I much prefer to watch MMA I'm much more enthusiastic about watching MMA I, I, I can watch jujitsu for 10 minutes before I get bored you know I love doing it but okay watching it is like it's not spectator friendly is I, it when they're like holding on with their arms around each other and it's just like do something sometimes like you see a lot of, of stalling yeah yeah <laughs> or MMA I, I just find there's a bit more 
jeopardy. Uh, there's a bit more. Yeah, yeah, you can get knocked the fuck out here, mate. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, so I, 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 and I love the technical side of MMA. You know, the striking and blah blah. So I was thinking, like, Jesus, I would love to do that for MMA. Mm. But of course, I've been working as an official on all of the shows, and I know the guys very well. Like Noel O'Keefe was there. He, he he used to do ring announcing and also commentary. So he'd be up and down, you know. Okay. Yeah, and he'd be there with Phil Campbell at a lot of the shows. He was a co-commentator. Brilliant at their jobs, yeah. And and I don't know the guys very well. Like We'd all catch up and have a coffee before the show starts. And literally that weekend, sitting at home, and it was the Sunday night, and I was looking on, scrolling through Instagram, and there was a post up. There'd been an MMA event on that day, and Noel posted up. Well, there you go. There, that's that's the last. That's me done now. I'm retired. I really enjoyed Clan Wars today. It was great crack. Blah blah. blah. Thanks to everybody for all their support over the years. And I was like, what the fuck? So I messaged him. Was like, what's going on? And he said, oh, you know, change jobs, moving down to the Midlands. It's a bit awkward now for traveling. We're having another kid. A few things going on. Okay. It's very time consuming. So I was like, right. Would you mind if I threw my name in the hat for this? Like, this is just the universe just landing something on my Crazy. lap. Like, and like, I've never been a big believer in that type of thing. But over the last couple of years, I'm like, I'm seeing huge instances of this happening. Like, so I was like, right, well, this is a fucking signal. Quick, quick, get the phone out. So look, the next couple of events that I'm booked to, to work on coming up, I messaged them a couple of promoters, Decky McLean and Declan Kenna. Uh, see that show there, there? I'll do that for you if you, want, if you need me to do that. I'll be a ring announcer and I'll be a commentator. What do you reckon? Okay. And they're just like... Yeah, sound like that. We don't have to go looking for someone because we know you. Mm. So that's that's cool. That that's that that's a I perfect see. fit. So you had like the contacts already, or you knew who to get in touch with. Yeah, well, I know I I know everybody in the circle. I've worked alongside all of these people, and they were they they just instantly said, "Yeah, no problem, no hesitation. Yeah. You're in, job done." Because they knew that you did a good job yeah. as a commentator. And again, I've been training for years, competing for years, officiating for years. So mm. I know the sport inside out. I'm well spoken. I'm. I could stand in the cage on the microphone, not be like shy or nervous or hesitant. Yeah. It's just not in me to be like that. Um, so I was like, grand. Well, there's there's the first couple booked. So I did those. And then the phone started ringing. Jesus, uh, are you free on this day? Blah, blah, blah. And next thing you know, I'm on like 95% of the, the shows through the rest of the year. And by the end of the year, it was just chaotic. I was like, just <laughs> me, my diary was just, was, was full. It's so um, exciting, it's, been, it's been a bit of a wild one, but, uh, and it's just so much fun. Mm. thoroughly enjoyed it and i'm working alongside really good co-commentators so it's really good um like it's a good vibe sort of like yeah. you're enjoying each other's we all company. know each other but we're and i'm learning a lot yeah you know yeah. from show it's to show to show it gets better and better and better but i just really enjoy the dynamic of it's mostly the commentary that i enjoy the ring announcing is good fun but i could take it or leave it you know what i mean are, are you making it like a fucking scene like do you go like oh, no see? yeah that's it you, you, you have to get into it and the more the longer you do it the more confident you get with it like you know so yeah you have to, um, it's great fun. Like the, one of the last events I did, the Cage Legacy one in the, it was at the Red Cow at that big top, that that uh, temporary venue they have up there. Big circus tent, basically. Yeah. And um, I remember just being in the middle of it, introducing some of the fighters like Max Lally and Conor McCarthy and Sean Bannon fighting on the main card. And you're just in the center and the place is crowded and, the, the, you know, they, they've brought lots of fans with them. And you're just announcing them into the cage, fighting out of the red corner, blah, blah, blah. You're, you're doing that and you, you're just standing right in front of them and you can see the adrenaline is just flowing through them and they're trying to control it and they're smiling at you going, this is it. Can't wait till you get out of this fucking cage and I can beat the shit out of that motherfucker over there. You know, you can really feel that energy off them. Yeah. And it's it's really good fun. And an Irish crowd as well. Ah, yeah, That's yeah, yeah. Fucking yeah. It's, it's a buzz, like, and you're responsible for basically getting that crowd on their feet and getting them hyped up, you know? So yeah. it's really good fun. But that being said, like, if I had to choose one that I could only do, it would be the commentary because I, it's a much more detailed job. It's a much more challenging job. Like, I have to spend all of this week now prepping notes for this show I'm doing on Friday night, looking up fighter records and, you know, he's, he's beaten this guy, lost to this guy. He's been caught in a guillotine three times over the last two years. You have to have all this information because when you're commentating, what you're doing is you're talking to the people who are watching on the live stream. And what you're going to have is you're going to have fellow fighters and teammates of the guy who's fighting but the vast majority are going to be friends and family who probably don't know shit about sport mm. so you have to strike the right balance between you know uh breaking down the technicalities of the fight but you also have to explain to the untrained eye this is why he's probably going to win this round in the judge's eyes this is what he needs to do now to improve this position you need to sort of dumb it down but at the same time not not dumb it down entirely because there are people who are like very highly skilled martial artists artists are also watching it so mm. it's 
it's a very interesting uh, dynamic and you just you have to basically tell the story of the fighter as well yeah. like he's been he's been training for four years under blah 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 he's you know he's he won his first four fights lost the last two he's on a two fight skid he's trying to get back and this is where he wants to go in future you know and people will watch these and then the next time they might see this guy fight again and they, oh yeah i remember watching this guy you know mm. so you're you're basically ingraining that fighter and their backstory into someone's consciousness so it's quite a if you do it right, it's quite a responsibility, I think, you know? Yeah. Um, you're you're like I said, you're you're telling the story of these guys. So it's it's about them. It's not about me. It's not about you know, you, you, it you has to be about those fighters and yeah. you have to do your very best to portray those fighters um in the right light. And you know, you have to you have to point out things that people are doing wrong. You have to point out the things that they're doing really well, and this is why he's 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 having such success in this fight, and this is where he's really dangerous. And this is what he could probably need to do to improve on to get out of it. You know, next time he fights, he could probably look at this. There's a whole lot going on, mm. but it's so enjoyable. Like I, I I can't get enough of it. You know? And when it comes to the athletes, right? So I would have grown up in a sports household. And in particular, so my brother would be playing football, right? Mm. And I remember growing up, a lot of coaches of his that were somewhat younger, trying to like look at what agents are looking at and all that. They used to go like, focus on not your social media, but try to market yourself and mm. tell like a story about yourself as an athlete. Do you see it somewhat easier to find information or the storylines of athletes that are like somewhat more active on social media or are pushing themselves more? Or do yeah. you have your own like journalist bank sort of? There's a couple of things. So there's a, a fantastic website called uh, Tapology. If you Google any fighter, be that an amateur fighter or a professional fighter, they on, on tapology.com, their whole record comes up. This is MMA, right? Yeah. Oh, I so, think I did it when I searched before my interview with Danny McCorma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, okay. it's great. So you can look it's through. really good. This Her is their 10 record. amateur fights. This is yeah. their nine professional fights this is how they were won what round what submissions like yeah. this is a gold mine so mm -hmm. I, I sat there yesterday after training and i just put my feet up and i went and i sat in a coffee shop oh i, I said i'd give christine a shout out dub and go cafe go in fibsborough Um, i go in there christine looks after me she's like my second mammy she she <laughs> makes me some food <laughs> cup of tea and i get the laptop out and the notebook and i just got a head start on the notes for this weekend so it's great and i'll just sit there and i'll just find all the info i need and then what I'll often do if I don't know the fighter, mm -hmm. I'll send them a little voice note via Instagram, say, hey, send me a little paragraph or two, just how long you've been training, how it's going. Okay. You know, where where do you see yourself going over the next while? And f like fighters who've had no fights and there's no record there, they might be making their debut. It's great for that, you know, and the most of them will get back to you. And like the odd one you don't, like there's one or two fighters that are making their debut this weekend and I haven't heard back from them, but you can fill the gaps in, you know. Okay. It's all good. You can just talk about what you're seeing in front yeah. of you, you know, in that case, but it's really good to be prepared i remember one of the first events i worked was working alongside phil campbell who's who's a commentator with me and phil works for one of the big um he's been doing this quite a long time he works for one of the big promotions in the middle east brave combat and he um i remember sitting down beside him and i had my notebook and i looked at his and it was like he had everything that could you could possibly know about each individual fighter now obviously he's been working on shows that have had those fighters on multiple times so okay. he's making more and more notes as he goes along mm. so um that was an eye opener for me it's like okay you need to get as much info as you can every time on these fighters and then show by show he okay he's on this show and i already did a show that he was on so i've notes compiled from that yeah. and then little notes i took after about you know his style what was working for him and then uh, what me and phil will often do then is he'll shoot me a text an hour or two before an event and he'll meet you in the we'll, we'll meet up in the hotel bar we'll get a coffee and we'll sit down we'll compare notes that's so exciting it's literally sorry no offense it's just a bunch of mma nerds that are getting paid oh, yeah, to talk yeah. about it's it's amazing like we're, yeah because we, we we're really enthusiastic yeah about, you know we both train we both compete and mm. stuff but we both just like being in the midst of it and just going right well this is you know we, we we're if we're going to do this we're going to do this fucking well yeah you know that's the yeah. big thing you know that's rather it. than uh, half-ass it don't half-ass anything no hello hello how are you doing I hope you're doing well. So very quickly, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say it because we're very close to hitting the targets for Q1 of 2023. We're clearly on a roll and the bigger the platform, the bigger the guests, the easier it will be for me to land guests for you to listen to new perspectives right over here. So please, <laughs> so please, if you don't mind, <laughs> maybe I can hire someone professional behind the camera to actually do this right, okay? <laughs> 
And if you're listening to this on audio, thankfully you wouldn't have caught up with the fuck up that just happened there. So please like, subscribe, follow, whatever you're doing and share it. Or even just DM me. Let me know what you think. I need those messages to keep myself up at night. Thank you so much. (laughs) And I think the one thing that I'm taking away from you is that you've been doing this for a really long time, Mm. but just by applying yourself to things that you love, Mm. years out the line, you're going to figure it out. Like something is going to like line up for you. Yeah. Make it work, you know? Yeah, that's it. What were like your biggest lessons from like your first like three, let's say five commentating jobs to the ones you're doing now? What was your biggest lesson or something that you had to work on that now you do quite well? Well, the first one would have been that being more prepared with with okay. notes and stuff. That's a huge one, you know. Um, after that, it's difficult to think of specifics, but because you've obviously improved since then, I would assume. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, definitely, just you know, being clear when you speak, not talking over each other. Mm. It, 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 it bugs me when I'm watching a live stream and commentators are shouting over each other. Like if the other guy is losing his mind and he's relaying something uh, relaying information about something that's going on you sit back let him let him drive and then step in when you're needed you know that kind of way so not hogging the mics oh absolutely yeah it's a big thing you know say like you're doing the exact same here on a podcast you're asking me a question then you're sitting there and you're letting oh. me <laughs> let me do my thing and then when i stop you're doing your thing and mm-hmm. so it's very important because if you're just listening to audio um as you're watching these fights and it's just non-discernible noise of mm. multiple voices and people sh- you know it doesn't work you need to uh, you need you need to just time your interjections properly, and uh, you don't need to just constantly be talking on it. Like I know I'm a bit of a a waffler. I like I like a chat, but no. when you're on a live stream, you you don't need to be. It's like as I said, it's not about you. It's about the fighters. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the one thing, probably with podcasting as well. Like a lot of people, the main compliment that I've received, weirdly enough, is that I know how to shut up. Mm. which is like funny but it is somewhat true oh it's huge but hugely important yeah. you do understand it with podcasting where there are a few people i i wouldn't even know them because i try to listen to the good podcasters but a lot of them just want to talk a lot and it's like that's for a solo episode if you want to do that yeah if it's about the guest go like i want i always transcribe my conversations i always go for around 80 to 20 Anything less than 20% of me talking, I'm happy with. If it's more, my heart starts to beat a little bit. I was like, what the fuck was I on like that day? But then it depends with the guest as well, the enthusiasm. Are we friends or not? If you Mm. are my friend, Paul, it would be a little bit like different because then we're just back and forth and we understand each other's timings and stuff. But that's fair enough when it comes to the commentating and whatnot because I was also curious to see like... Not if there are differ- difficult characters to work with, but there would be some characters that would want to hold on to the mic for a lot. But then those people usually, I'm assuming, would get, get sussed out really quick and like, listen, mate, you talk a lot. Like, I won't see you next time, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking that the, the couple of guys that I work with, it's predominantly um, just two guys. So Phil, who I've just spoken about, and Andrew McGatton, who is, um, I work with him on, on on two different promotions and they're very different. Yeah. Phil is very professional and slick sounding and, you know, he, he's just a very professional broadcaster mm-hmm. type voice. And Andrew, we just know each other a long time and it's very tongue in cheek. So I find myself sort of settling into his groove. <laughs> so I behave differently on the mic when I'm next to him than I do with Phil. I, I try to, I, I subconsciously sort of go, fall into that professional commentator mode with Phil and we, we both sound very pro, but Andrew is, is just constantly like it, the first fight will start and the first thing he'll start doing is he'll start waffling on about some guy's haircut. <laughs> These are the best two mullets we've seen in the cage all evening, you know, so then we start having a little bit of a, you know, we start getting a just little bit back and forth. Start taking the piss and, and stuff. Yeah, I, I sort of have to, I try to be the straight lace guy there and sort Love. of just keep diverting back to the fights. But yeah. we do we, we do it a little <laughs> bit more tongue in cheek and we have good fun with it because we know each other through jujitsu since since we were white belts, like beginners, mm-hmm. like 10, 12 years ago. So it's like, uh, we get on really well, you know, and we, we, we have a bit of crack with it. So it's an interesting sort of shift in dynamic, you know. But you want to, like a little bit of entertainment too i think that's the good thing about independent 
yeah independently run events you're just like yeah these, these are like the good people like if you what if you don't come to these then like you're not that real one sort of yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're sort of left to our own devices yeah, with it as yeah, well yeah, we can do it as uh, whatever way we want you know uh, but it's grand, like <laughs> it's great fun and then we like we, between fights we'll be checking twitter and people will be messaging us yeah you know giving us a little bit of stick too and or tit tagging us and things you know the commentary is so important though that's the one thing that I, whenever i watch um sorry I, I always get in trouble but it's fine like I'm not going to be bringing on anyone whenever I watch RTE sports right the fucking commentators are always critiquing the Irish teams or the Irish athletes like no other mm. ripping them apart I'm like lads mm. <laughs> come on now like calm down Jesus like a little bit of positivity and the reason why I'm saying this is because of Twitter the amount of people that complain on Twitter saying guys be a bit yeah, more yeah. sound i've seen it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. like th like they're not taking that advice or just like it, which is interesting in fairness every time i i find it a blast because i'm not irish hmm. you know so i'm just like shocked to my core i just linger on afterwards i don't even watch the sports yeah i'm there to like see what the fuck they have to say <laughs> fucking grumpy people mm. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah everyone loves being um Oh. <laughs> everyone loves the, the, their own opinion opinions are like assholes you know yeah and, uh, everyone likes them but at the same time like I, i'm commentating always on fights so yeah. there's a bit of a bit of a thing there you don't want to be criticizing a fighter for the sake of criticizing a fighter and maybe in the same way you would in a, another sport mm. these guys are out there getting their their, their heads beat in uh, if you're going to offer criticism it has to be constructive i'm always very conscious of that i don't it's, i don't deliberately try to be like oh just nice about everybody no um if someone is doing something wrong i'll right he needs to do this a little bit better blah blah but i won't just slate him do you know slate. what i mean i think that's just it, and it pisses me off when i see fans doing it on social media someone loses a fight oh he fucking quit he's a pussy and I'm like shut your mouth mate they really troll them yeah they really fucking troll them yeah that really bugs me yeah 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 that's you, you so you don't tough. know what it takes to get in there you probably don't you've probably never been punched in the face mm. and it, it it turns my stomach when when people are are just uh, putting fighters down and and just being abusive towards them you know fa you're like nameless or faceless people on Twitter a lot of people that think that they can do it though and it's oh yeah it, because it's just like oh they should do this they should do that and it's like lads even if you're really good on pads mm -hmm. but different. you don't compete it's different i hit pads every week and then i spar i'm like oh this is different <laughs> oh he's hitting me back what yeah. the fuck like, <laughs> i'm like what do you mean this punch that sounded so fucking uh -huh. crisp and it's just like and you're still standing yeah there. he just kicked me in the leg what the <laughs> fuck the pads don't do that no they don't but that's it a lot of people think that and then even worse when they don't even practice any sport mm. or would have never competed in anything in their life i would have gone from individual and individuals i would have started out in karate weirdly enough Oi. and then that was my childhood and then i went over to a team sport what was i that? fucking love uh, football okay. football and then handball Oi. um i fucking love the team sport Oi. because when i lost when we lost there was a we it wasn't an i yeah i used to take losing really tough as a child right yeah yeah in yeah. martial arts especially it was i don't know why i felt like i used to suffer a lot with mental block as a kid so i understand that completely like through sports mm. i was like a little child like nine years old if i lost i was under my bed like oh yeah, yeah yeah it was bad yeah but that only started when kumite was introduced which is like fighting each yeah. other so i have this clip i've never put this online because it's a bit weird but it's me so i would suffer with asthma and i was having a panic attack before and what age were you 11 or 12 right. and they it wasn't weight class it was a, it was just girls so there i was 11 or 12 facing a 15 year old like f <laughs> a 15 year old giant now i'm small and i'm 25 let alone when i was 11 mm. and she was also quite tall for her age and all i see because i have it there um, is me just hyperventilating, right? And the referee stops the match, gets my Ventoline, <laughs> spritz it in my mouth. Go fight. <laughs> oh. 
that happened. Mm. And after that, the mental block was introduced and I couldn't be competing in like Kumite anymore. So then it was just Katos for me. When, it was, when the sport wasn't for me anymore, then I went on to a team sport. Game changer. Game changer. I was like, shit, man, I can fucking do this all the time. Mm. It was so much better. Individual sports, like you need, there is some darkness to it. Yeah. it and at your guys' rate, especially with MMA, with jujitsu, Muay Thai, Mm. all this kind of stuff you're probably losing especially at the start of your career way more than you're winning Mm -hmm. yeah and it's tough to keep showing up all the time like something really different with danny mccormick i interviewed her after her first professional loss with bellator yeah and i Funnily enough, I got her at SBG right when she walked in for the first time because she would have had elbow surgery right after. And she's like, Deb, on air, she goes like, Deb, I feel like I'm going to cry. Like the moment that I saw all the fighters like walk in, they kind of looked at her like, ah, you lost. Mm. And she's like, I feel like I'm going to cry. I'm not. But like, that's the reality of it. Since then, I was like, these people are fucking gladiators Mm. of our time. Yeah. Absolutely. Gladiators. Built different, you know? Built different. Yeah, like, absolutely. Uh, I do can't that. fucking do it. Like, like you say that thing about the whole team sports versus individual sports. So mm-hmm. I came from a team sport to this and I 100% prefer the onus just being on me. This is my responsibility. Yeah. Win or lose, it's mine. Yeah. As you an know? adult, you get it as well. Eh? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's different. Um, yeah, I find, I find, I find it's, it suits me. So it's, it's individual personalities, you mm. know? But I would rather be there and you know, being part of a team where half the motherfuckers aren't pulling their weight or, you know, I played football for years and I wasn't, I wasn't much good. So you're sort of in and out of the team and you're just like, oh, this is bollocks. Like, like, you know, it's frustrating and, you know, you're trying your best and then someone else isn't trying their best and you're losing because of that. I found that whole thing just very annoying. As an individual, going from individual to a team sport, Mm. I struggled to join a team. Right, yeah. Because in football, I was a keeper. So I was technically by myself. Yeah. When I joined, like, as a player in handball, Mm. it was really fucking difficult for me. Like, uh, it was quite a turning point in my personality that took me years. Right. Years. You're you're there by yourself. Mm. What do you mean possible? Yeah. Like, Like, we we have, like, our sport is, you're you're part of an unbelievable family when you're doing it. mm. Because we look out for each other. We're all very close. And, you know, we train together and we trust each other and... You know, you, you'll meet some lifelong friends once you take up a sport like this. But when you compete, it's you. Yeah. It's down to you. You can you can, you don't have to compete. And most people that do jujitsu don't compete. It's it's a small section of the people that do it actually compete. And even a smaller section will do will do it regularly. Some yeah. people will just dip their toes in and out of it once or twice. But uh, you'll get you'll get the, the the very small percentage will be like every opportunity testing themselves, addicted to competition and addicted to winning and what's the mental characteristic that you can like pinpoint that's common among all of them besides being competitive it's a difficult one um i will watch a lot like i like people watching and stuff and i watch a lot of the people i'm surrounded by and it's very very difficult to pinpoint one common trait maybe it's a few different ones but you know you'll have people who come like i come from like i said a single parent background Maybe you're just trying to be noticed, trying mm-hmm. to be heard. Like I grew up with I three sisters and a mam. I was the one on the outside. Yeah. So if there were the, like my mam wasn't there, three girls are there. And if there was a fight at home, ma, he did this, he did that. You know, we're all very close now as adults, but that's just a common trait. You're growing up. You're like, yeah. fuck is I'll, I'll be the, I'll be the outsider here. I'll be the black sheep, whatever. Maybe it's that. I don't know. I could be guessing someone more highly qualified than me would be able to tell me, but I know, I know quite a lot of the, 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 the guys are trained who come from a similar background, working class backgrounds, council estate, maybe a broken home. Maybe there's a little bit of that going on, you know, mm. or you know, I was getting bullied when I was a kid and I need to, I need to now just show people how tough I am. They have like a dark story, prove yeah. people wrong. Yeah. But that you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at them now. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You probably wouldn't be able to look at me now and say, really, he was bullied when he was a Fair kid. They're coping with it, right, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd rather be doing that than, <laughs> you know, looking for the answers in the bottom of a pint glass, uh, which a lot of people do. And, and, and uh, you know, I, like I, I had all through my twenties, I, I didn't do any of this stuff. I didn't, I didn't train. I didn't start training martial arts till I was in my thirties. But I, like my avenue back then was go get fucked up, go get drunk, go get out of your mind, go, you know, and that, that happened for a long time. I was dealing with like, I had um, 
we had a death in our family and stuff and so you know so there's trauma and there's no real way of handling it so that was that was what i did but now since this came along it's like no i'm a bit that, that that's a, another avenue now for you know whatever is inside you that you need to work out whatever stresses that are there okay well have somewhere to go where i can just switch off from it all and i can be around positive people and 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 uh people are happy to see you when you walk in the door and you're welcomed in and you have fun while you're there and then you come out of there feeling like a different person yeah you know if we all had something like that in our lives all the time what what I think the key thing is for that sort of thing, because I know that there are people that like sports isn't for them. Yeah. You need to figure out the activity that helps you not concentrate on whatever you have at mm -hmm. home. Yeah. Because I remember that that was the key thing when I signed up for like, I remember when I was in Galway, I signed up for like a K1 beginners course. Right. And then when I was in Dublin, Muay Thai. And it was literally just like, I can't concentrate on, like my brain has to switch off. Not because this place has become my safe spot, but it's because I'm listening to someone else give me instructions. Mm -hmm. You have to do push-ups for a minute. You can't be like, listen, no. Mm -hmm. Versus if you were at a gym, you're battling yourself. Mm. I'm also really shit with numbers. So I'm not good with lifting because I'm like, where the fuck am I? Yeah, like, yeah, what yeah. number am I on? If I don't need to count, I'm happy. Yeah. Um, but that was basic. that's basically it. It's like, I can't concentrate on anything else except what I'm being told. Yeah, being taken no out of your own head is important, you know? That's it. That's it. Like, And that's where like good coaches and good teachers come along. Where it's and, just and being coachable is important. It's a, that's, a, that's a difficult thing for a lot of people. And it was always difficult for me. Mm. But I'm... Um, I'm far better with that now. Like I'm training Muay Thai, like I said today, I'm a white belt there. Mm. So I, I, I'm, I'm not, like I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu and I go to jiu-jitsu and people are asking me questions and trying to get me to help them with stuff. You know, I like going to Muay Thai. I have a really good coach, Kali Mann, and he's like, a fun, this guy is like, there's people that coach you and they just turn up to punch the clock and they, yeah. you know, they put you through this workout that they put the other guy through. But this guy, Kali, will work with me and he'll, he'll basically get, walk through things that I need to be doing. Do you like being a student, Paul? I fucking love it, yeah. And yeah. I wasn't always like that. Like, you know, a little bit earlier when I was doing jujitsu and I was like a blue belt and I was starting to win a lot of things and I was getting to, you know, my ego was like, ah, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty good at this. Like, okay. you know, you're, you're not as good of a student then yeah. because you don't listen as much. But like now it's just like, oh, no, no, no. I've been doing it so long, I realize I know fucking nothing here. I'm, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not what I thought I was. I'm not, now I listen and I pick things up so much better because I'm open to it. You know, there's just more maturity and mm. a little less ego at play, but in there today, and there's a combination Collie's going through with me and I'm not, I'm just, I'm not, it's not computing right. My upper body's moving it correctly, but my legs are not moving exactly what the way he wanted me to do it. Stop, we'll slow it right down. Let's take it, do it, do it step by step. Brilliant coach realizes where I'm going wrong, slows it down, doesn't get frustrated. Let's walk through this. Boom, boom, we do it. And I just love that. I love just being in in a in a sort of an area that like I only started back doing Muay Thai a few months back, but so I'm just, it's very it's all very uh, very new to me. But I can see the improvements, the, you know, and I'm really enjoying the whole process of just being that white belt again. And it's a lot of people don't don't do that, you know. They don't embrace that. They don't like being talked at. They don't like. They're not good at just handing over the the keys and letting someone else drive control and just yeah yeah. And I think it's important for people to do that. Mm. martial arts is a great way of doing that but like you said it's not the only way like sport is not the only way there's there's other things you can do where you can just go somewhere learn to do something different but what that'll do is it'll take you out of your head where you're you're just circling around all the bullshit because we all have bullshit especially in this day and age where we all have horrible shit going on or horrible stresses because everyone is getting swamped a little bit you know whether it's financial or family or whatnot but uh someone that's just going to guide you through something else and you can learn something and, and just decompress a little bit and then we can come back and that'll still be there afterwards but we can come back to it later we can we can just take you away from it for a little while by distracting Literally you with something hour. else yeah an hour that's yeah. it yeah it so it? good for you mentally just to get that reset yeah. and then you'll come out of there a different person and as i said it doesn't have to be a sporting activity no. it can be anything you know and it doesn't need to become your personality either like a lot of people um tend to go like it's it's all or nothing yeah it's all or nothing no yeah. it, it doesn't need to be like obviously for this like this is my thing right mm. i want it to be my all one day yeah but i also know it's not life or death so like 
it's just playing the wrong long game and being a student of the craft and of yeah. conversations and stuff. Learning and improving. Exactly. Like I know that I can't be the best overnight. I can't. Mm. I can't. No one can. But that's like a very tough pill to swallow even for me. It's like I know and that's what I'm trying to like battle with. But it comes with time, I think, and maturity where I can't be the best in class immediately. Mm. No fucking way. I can watch all the videos I want won't happen until like I experience and everything That's in, it. in saying that though so I'm sure a lot of people are wondering why there's a different poster on the television like flipping around and stuff it will come up there you go Valkyries so I wanted you to come here to give me some advice and all that so for those that don't know I recently got my first opportunity to ask questions to Muay Thai fighters and it's the first all female Muay Thai event in Ireland. So it's kind of like historic in mm, fairness. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, so what are you going to do on that night? I think I'm the ring announcer. I'll have to double check. Ring with them, but I'm, I'm pretty we sure need they have me booked for that day. When we're there. Yes. Like we'll take Defo. a good photo from here to there. Yeah. But in saying that, so this is like my first time actually fighting, sorry, not fighting, um, asking questions at an event. Right. What are people looking at? So I know you touched on the topic that mostly like friends are watching and family that don't really understand the sport. Mm. What is the audience looking for when it comes to the athlete or what? The so are you going to be t interviewing fighters in the ring? No, I'm going to be interviewing the winners afterwards okay. and I'm doing a few interviews before. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what will like people be looking at content-wise content or what does the audience usually want? Just a little bit of the basic backstory of each fighter usually. Um, you know, you can get them to relay a little bit of information about themselves, how long have you been training, how has training camp been going, you know, um, how do you see the fight playing out, mm. Where, you know, little things like that. And fighters will usually, they'll have a set idea, you know, this is how I think I'm going to win this fight and this is where I'm really strong and this is why I'm going to I'm gonna come out on top, you know. So they'll, they'll usually give you plenty of information based off that. Um, like get, getting the basic bits of information, like how experienced are they, how good are they, mm. you know. What's your take on female fighters right now? So I know you mentioned Shauna Bannon. Yeah. And the likes of that. So obviously, also you're a father of two girls. Mm, yeah. So you are used to or exposed to a different type of character when it comes to women in sport. Now, I've been on the other side of the ring where I'm posting said content and I get a little bit of shtick from usually younger, mostly lads, unfortunately, that are trying to take the piss all the time. Mm. You're like, how do you deal with this? What do you do? Mm, yeah, uh, teenagers, boys. Mm, mostly yeah. and yeah. sometimes a few la like men yeah sometimes yeah what's you the can, crack with this you can get some guys are just they haven't been fucking reared right you know what i mean and i mean i was a little asshole like that when i was a teenager is it just trolling yeah dickheads i had it the other day actually it was funny when i was walking through um, a park just beside my house i was walking my dog mm. and about 100 yards up ahead there's a little bridge and i saw these three little teenagers sitting on the the bridge and they were just gonna be being a bit dickheady to people that were walking by, like going, mm -hmm, you know, people going by. So I was like, I was coming up to this going, oh, fuck, here we go. Here we go. So I'm walking up with, I've got my little dog on a lead and they're, you know, they're giving, <laughs> they give some L1 stick as she's going by. I'm like, oh, my Lord. So I will just walk, just as I go past, I get a, uh, in my ear. So I turn around and I grab the guy with the jacket and lean them off the bridge and went, can you swim? No. <laughs> and he, the three of them just went white and I pulled them back up. Tapped them and just walked on, and I turned around and they were gone. <laughs> so uh, sometimes they just need to be put back in their box, and I'll guarantee they haven't sat on that bridge since and abused anyone. <laughs> I think that sometimes they just need to be they need to be uh, they need to be scared into reality. <laughs> they need to be fuck's sake. No one's giving them a clatter. That's the problem. I see. Okay. That's the problem. Yeah, because like that's the one thing I never like. Comment sections never fucking bug me, mm. but the one thing that always goes whether I'm on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, whenever I see a women in sports post and I see the fucking who cares ones, I didn't know that the WNBA was a thing. Every fucking time it's the same shite. And I'm like, get over it. Mm -hmm. Like, stop. So obviously, like, such, like, events are so important. But, like, what's so even more important is getting support from women and men and this bullshit to fucking stop one day. 
Yeah. Like that's basically it. But anyways, like besides like the complaining and stuff, um, you, you're seeing these female fighters, whether it's Muay Thai, mm. Jiu Jitsu or whatever, they're a different breed. Like obviously it's not the same as like male athletes because they're female athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Describe to me what these fucking fighters are like. The, the female fighters that we have in the country right now, some of them, like at the higher level, like the likes of Shauna and Danny and Sinead Kavanagh, Lee McCourt, you've got you've got people that are really making big strides in the in the professional game. They're all phenomenal fighters, you know. And then we have a really good bunch of like I'm just looking at it uh, from an MMA standpoint because those are the people I know. We have a really good selection now of female fighters coming through. We're very talented, and. I had this discussion the other day. So in Team Rhino, where I trained, it was always very male dominated. We had some girls that came in and trained for a while, but it's always been like 90 something percent blokes. And over the last couple of years, that's slightly changed a little. We have a handful of girls there now that are, are there quite a while, you know, purple belts in Jiu Jitsu. Um, it cut, one girl became an amateur world champion in mixed martial arts in the Dean. Another girl, Natty, is training there a year and she's in the place seven days a fucking week working like you know working working anyone else in the gym so we have a crew there now of, of girls that they to me it doesn't feel like they're going to be gone in a year it feels like they're part of the fabric there now and it's growing a little bit yeah. and next year there might be a few more mm-hmm. and the year after that there might be a few more so it's a very daunting thing for a girl to walk into an environment like that and train especially doing something like mma or jiu-jitsu you're literally it's close contact I did. I'm on top class. of you squashing yeah. you, and you know it's. I did one jujitsu class, and I was like, "It's not for me." Yeah. Like the moment that I saw, sorry, there was a lad that sweat through his rash guard and his gi. It's a lot of and discomfort. Get your balls out of my face. Dude. Yeah, it's a lot of discomfort, and you basically to do jujitsu and to to even get past that first hurdle, mm-hmm. you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And then you need to spend a few years being the nail, whatever else is the hammer, and then eventually you get to a point where okay, now I'm now I'm the hammer a little bit because there's, there's people here that start that after I started and I can fuck them up and then a few years later you're fucking everyone up but that's a long haul before you get to that point so it takes a very strong brave woman to walk into an environment like that and thrive Mm. and achieve it really does so you're seeing that and anyone you see that's reached any decent competition level in jiu-jitsu or mixed martial arts they've gone through that whole journey before they ever got to the point they're at now and a lot of those girls are going to go on a lot further yeah. and, and really, really achieve massive things. And it's, um, they're a small percentage, but it's, um, I, I think it's phenomenal, you know, mm. because just there's all the talk, you know, we're equal, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, a simple biological fact is Dana White is bigger and fucking stronger than his missus. And if he decides to smack her over the head, that's an uneven fight. You know what I mean? That's what a lot of people are saying, yeah. And that, that carries over. It doesn't matter, mate, if she hits you first and you can sit there and say gender equality and, you know, fuck, we're all... You know, it doesn't fucking matter. If a woman raises her hand to you, you cannot fucking hit her back. Mm. You cannot because men are fucking bigger and stronger at the end of the day. So for a woman to walk into an environment that requires her to do that all the time and fucking wrestle men and fight men and to actually thrive and improve and get to a really high level at it, to me, that's one of the biggest things you can do mm-hmm. in life. It's it's a phenomenal achievement that should never be downplayed. Fucking never. And it sickens me when people do that and they talk down about, you know, female fighters. We had uh, Shauna's last fight. Um, she fought a girl called Kerry Isom, who she she beat in her pro debut last year. I comment, That was one of the first shows I commentated on. That was like maybe April. And Kerry went off and won another fight. And she's from the UK, so she went and she won another fight. So she was one and one. I think, did she lose another one? Was she one and two? So she had one win and two losses. And then Shauna's fight in December, her opponent pulled out and Kerry came in as a late replacement. The people were going, she's already beaten her. Mm. Like Kerry has a record of one and two as a pro. So it it doesn't look fantastic. But I'm there to commentate. So I know Kerry's record inside out. I look at her amateur record, nine and oh as an amateur. This girl is class. Is she the one from Cork SBG? No, no, she's from, uh, that's Kerry Vernon, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing little fighter as well. But uh, Kerry Isom, uh, nine and oh as an amateur. Whoa. Three pro fights. Shauna beat her in in two of them, I think, or or she had lost two of them. But you're looking at her pro record going, no, that's not a great record. Why is Shauna fighting a girl that doesn't have a winning record and that she's beaten already? And people were talking down about her. It's going, hold on, you don't know how tough this girl is you're just judging her just off those numbers you're looking at but sean is the only person who's ever beaten her mm. you know um 
so it, and, and that girl came in and it turned up it turned into a battle and Shauna got the win mm. but she 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 scraped the win it was a very tough fight people were thinking oh she's just going to beat this girl comfortably Bellator lost February what was the highlight fight in my opinion anyway Sinead Kavanaugh and Liam McCord yeah absolutely everyone was, fucking lootly. everyone was talking about that Sinead Kavanaugh on one leg managed to win that fight ripping yeah. Liam McCord is about to pop Sinead's shoulder out yeah. like everyone was just like squeamish and looking yeah away. I was in bed watching that and I couldn't fucking sleep then for about two hours after because of the adrenaline I was there. Push. Yeah, it was it was an amazing fight. It you know? was unreal. But for people to talk down, and people do, they talk down their nose about these fighters, and it it just it's sickening to me because you don't know this is this is not the same as watching two male fighters of the same level. Did you hear that crack? Yeah, that's my dislocated elbow. It cracks yeah. like a knuckle all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it pops all the time in public, and people are like, what? And I'm like, uh, I don't know what that oh, was. No. <laughs> um, yeah, but like for for it's not the same. Like it's one thing talking down about male fighters, but you have to understand that the female fighters who are on the same level of uh, like let's say that you're comparing it to a fighter, a male fighter on the same par. This female fighter has come through so much more than that bloke ever fucking did. Like even just like sparring, right? And there's only like one woman in a class of twenty, and she's looking around like taking turns, and all the not all of them, but there will be a few lads like with their chins down, like no, I don't want to. Mm. Like that's also like not even embarrassing. I've been on that end where it's just like okay, like, let me, like, keep looking to try meet eye contact with one, like, unlucky person that goes, like, yeah, sure, okay. Like, even that bit mm. is tough, let alone what everything else they go through. You're already going to be self-conscious in that environment, you know, and it's yeah, it's very tough to see when people are just disparaging about the, about their achievements and stuff. It's like, mm. no, mate, you don't understand what these, these women went through. And just women in general in Ireland, I think you get a bit of a raw deal. Like you saw that whole bullshit with the soccer team. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like that sickened me to my stomach seeing that girl being... Uh, brought onto Sky Sports News and being spoken down to like a bold child. Did you see it when they did that? That was this guy. I'm not Irish, right? Mm. And when I fucking saw that, I was like, "Are is he joking? Yeah. You know what the only... Re First of all, you want to make a fucking scene out of someone, you know? Yeah. What? How dare you say educated? Also, you're fucking English. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Off. Aside from that, you're, Be besides <laughs> that, you're you're English. the last person who could talk. You know who could who could talk to someone like this. It but. happens all the time, man. Mm. And I like so often I call my dad that I'm like fucking hell, pa. Like I hate the fact that I have to deal with this just because of like what I have between my legs, and and obviously in a different language. But he keeps going. He's like, listen, Deb, this is what you have to go through. Like. You, this is what you have to deal with, whether it's in business, whether it's in sports, whatever the fuck you need to do. It's very difficult, even as a team, right, to just get some fucking respect on your name. Mm -hmm. It's so difficult all the time. And it's like, where's the money? That's the that's always like the main thing. Like, where's the money? And it's like, yeah, fair. Besides the ban on women's sports that's been happening all along, I'm really trying to get educated on this. But besides the ban on women's sports, it's also just difficult because if women keep knocking on doors, let me play, let me play. Katie Taylor was the one that brought fucking boxing at the Olympics yeah. that's been going since the fucking Greek times. A fucking superhero, that woman. Yeah, yeah exactly. 2012. Mm. 10 years, 11 now. Come on, dude. What yeah. do you mean? It's a different like. And even still, like professional or like boxing for women, they still have two minute rounds compared to the three minute rounds for yeah, boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like why? Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Why not just fucking uniform it in mixed martial arts? It's the exact same. Women, men, doesn't yeah. matter. You will see MMA cards. Ronda Rousey headlining a UFC card. Oh, Ronda just, Rousey was such a fucking nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Jesus she, Christ. She, she, she was pissed people off with her her, her character and, and, and Oh that. my god. I she was my first exposure to as a female fighter to like the UFC. But what well, yeah, but what she did was she she, was she brought this, eyes in the sport. She did, she did. She was dislocating yeah. fucking people's shoulders. She was fucking people up. Disgusting. Yeah. yeah. yeah disgusting it's a pity what happened to her with the holly home thing yeah she kind of went downhill from there yeah 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 she, be, she she was her own worst enemy the way she handled the and it, particularly that defeat not not so much the one after but mm -hmm. she was her own worst enemy you know she, she turned a lot of people off her for good and uh -huh. it's it's a shame because she's not looked at then in retrospect in the same way that she should be looked at she was a fucking pioneer 
of that sport and now you it's just natural to see women headlining mixed martial arts like I've worked on a couple of cars where Shauna was the main event mm. the main attraction at the at the thing and selling most of the tickets and you know it's it's great to see but um, Rhonda was the first to do it you know but she was she was there's a lesson there to be learned uh, how to handle a defeat you know I think there has been like a lot of lessons that have come from that I think sl- like Israel um Izzy mm. the way he came out after he lost he's like lads I'm fine yeah like well, I'm not gonna be crying I'm okay mm. I I get to sleep like Conor McGregor did the same after Nate Diaz mm. uh, submitted him and Dominic Cruz after he lost to Cody Garbrandt which is fairly unexpected in a world title fight but I remember t- in particular those two coming out and doing the exact same thing came out to the post-fight press conference stood there a glass of whiskey on the desk mm. hit me with your questions and just owned it yeah you know and this is part and parcel of sport whereas Ronda just fucking she went went just yeah. uh, hiding in the hills I think that was at the time though sorry to interrupt you there Um, uh, I think it was at the time though where we had Floyd Mayweather with the 50 and all like mm-hmm. there was the whole spiel about undefeated records I'm undefeated I'm undefeated and that was the only thing that you were relying on at yeah. the time Versus now there has been that shift and thankfully, who knows if Ronda Rousey was a UFC fighter at at this time, Hmm. whether or not with those lessons from previous fighters, whether or not her defeat would have been different. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But also it is her character as well. She was a fucking champ. Yeah. Yeah. She was a champ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were like um, born driven winner, you know, a lot to prove. Her mother obviously raised her just to Mm. win and only win. And uh, didn't take it well at all, you know. And like it's it's, it's sad to see, you know, because it's it's not uh, it's not a very attractive characteristic. But you you do like to see when a fighter is defeated like that, or when you know when they just own it and just go right. I can learn from this. I can improve from this, and then they, they come back better. Yeah, uh, you know, and and um, they, they they bring themselves back to the top of the mountain. It's it's mm. it's always a fascinating tale to me, you know. Yeah, and they encourage like the younger generations to not fear the loss as well. Yeah. Like me, like hiding under my bed. Yeah, that's it. Like, yeah, like I'm, I, I, like I've got two girls to raise, like I said earlier. So the, these are all things that I'll be um trying to impart onto them. Like, I mean, I've, I've competed like in jujitsu over the, the years so many times and I've, I've lost more matches than most people have had matches, mm. but I've also won more medals than, than most people will, will, will ever win as well. So because I competed just so much. And every every match you have, every tournament you enter, win or lose, you 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 gain from it, mm-hmm. and you come back and you 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 know your your preparation becomes a little bit better. Your mental preparation, in particular, always 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 you you learn how to make it that little bit better, that little bit sharper and stronger. And uh, if you're you know if you just have an easy route to victory all the time, you'll hit, hit a roadblock then at some point where you're 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 facing a challenge and you just won't be able to surpass that challenge and it'll turn you away from the sport and you do see that a little bit with people who kind of have it easy early on mm. and then they uh they can't really kind of keep that going you need to be tested and um it's a, it's very important in life but people don't you know they, they shy away from it they'll try a competition once get smashed oh fuck that i'm never doing that again you know and oh, that's not really the right approach it's about you. You know, you should learn something from that and go. Well, right, well, I was probably never going to win that because that guy or that girl was way better than me anyway. But there's things I could have done better. So let's try this again against someone else and see can I do those things, but can I do them a little bit better? Mm. And then just go from there. You can use that as a tool for growth, and that could, that carries over into the rest of your life so much. It's very very important, and you know, it's like exposure to failure. That's what I'm getting from you. Absolutely, that's the key to growth. Yes, 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 absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I love that, man. I fucking yeah. love that. I'm it's loving. It's hugely this important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that's, so that, that's what I love about people in the the community. I mean, like the the mixed martial arts or the jiu jitsu community, surrounded by people that are just getting tapped out day out day out. Mm. You know, but they keep coming back for more. To try, oh, 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 maybe it'll be better today. Yeah. I'll try and do this differently today. I'm going, oh, I learned this, and I'm going to try to fucking inflict this on this motherfucker. I'm going to pass your guard tomorrow, prick. And you, you just get that. And people are just really excited, and they're always happy to be there. And the, you know, we're testing ourselves, and it's an emotional roller coaster. But we're there doing it and we're all like minded souls because we're, we're all chasing that little bit of improvement. Mm. Just that like 0.0001% all the time. And we all want to see each other get better. It's very important too. Did you have like a life changing moment where that switch happened? Was there a particular match or was it a, a session where you're just like, I'm going to have to change in order for this to benefit me more? Um. I'm not sure in that regard, but I definitely did have a big one where I 
that little crack you heard in my elbow, I dislocated that arm badly. I was, oh yeah, I snapped it. The arm went that way, and the hand was over there, and it was the two bones were separated nice. from the. Yeah, it was beautiful. So I had that, and I was like, I had been training a couple of years. I did some kickboxing fights, novice MMA fights. I was a blue belt in jujitsu, and I'd compete now and again in jujitsu, but I'd never won a tournament. I'd never won anything. So then once I got this set back into place, it was like, oh, this is going to be sore for a long time. Like I couldn't straighten that arm fully for like two years. Mm. But I was back training jujitsu a couple of months later. I was like, oh, I can go back and train if I just work on like technical stuff and don't, you know, I'm not really going balls to the wall. So then I realized, right, if I want to do this, um, I need to learn a new style that I can keep this arm safe where it's not out here, where it's in danger, where someone can grab it and, you know, because the arm still doesn't, that's, that's my mobility oh, wow. in my arm like yeah, yeah yeah but it's 100 percent strong now it's it's, okay. it's really fucking strong but for a long time i had to be very conscious of not to get even in any awkward positions so i had to just knuckle down and go right i, I can't just go rolling for the sake of rolling i can't just go training i need to now learn the intricacies of the game learn some new styles some new techniques blah, blah blah so on a skill level i improved a lot in that next six months i was back competing like three months later just with a sore arm like it was it was weak and it was sore, but I was able to just use the other arm and then blah, blah, blah. and it it drove me to just get better, better. And then I reached the point where oh, I won a tournament. Oh, I won another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. Shit. And they just gold medals were coming thick and fast. And that was after an injury where you're like, okay, I'm gonna have to get really strong and understand well, like my unfair advantage, sort of. The most readily available option at that time was to never go back to jujitsu or MMA. Yeah, that was that was the one. Oh, you're gonna stop that now, aren't you? Mm. I'd one of my, my best friend Ray. Um, we're, we've been friends since we were kids and we started in this game together and he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, same as I am now, you know, um, one of my closest friends in the world. And he, uh, got a really, really, really bad eye poke probably in and around the same time in competition match starts. Let's go to take grips on each other. Guy's thumb goes right in there and he comes up to me and they're like, match is called off instantly. Obviously he was really injured. He comes up and he goes, this is fucked. Oh. I'm going to go to the hospital. I said, I'll drive you. Because I was working at the event. He goes, no, 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 I'm grand. I'll drive, I'll drive. He goes in there, they're like, well, we need to bring you in for surgery, mate. Your eye is fucked, like torn fucking cornea and all sorts of shit. And that surgery didn't work, it didn't take. So they had to go and get it done again. Mm. And then he was saying to me, people are just telling me I need to knock this on the head now. I was like, huh? And he just wasn't in him to quit. Same as it wasn't in me to quit when my arm broke. And the two of us are still there and we're black belts in jiu-jitsu People decide years that later. for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they you know, decide that. I had knee injuries. Um, I had one where I, 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 my knee swelled up randomly one Friday. I was supposed to fight the next day. And I went home and put my foot up, put some ice on it. And I went for a nap and I woke up and my knee was bright purple and I could feel the heat emanating off it. I was like, something's wrong. Yeah. And then I felt dizzy. Rang me ma, as that's the first thing you do when you're, you know, <laughs> and, uh, when, when you're in trouble. Ma, come get me. She brought me to hospital and they were like, if you didn't come in here, mate, you could have been in real trouble. That's really badly infected. Like it's you could have fucking died or something. Like so stop. I ended up I was in I was in um I was in a bed in the hospital for like eight days on an antibiotic drip. So and there were physios in there coming in to me going, What is this sport you do? Oh yeah, you can't ever do that again. I'm like, what? Mm. But then like you realise afterwards, no, hold on, this is working again now. I'm fine. I I can fix yeah. this. I can I'm not gonna walk away that easy. This is what I love doing. This is what my cir circle of friends is. Like Yeah. I'm you an SNC coach. Yeah. Fuck you. And now it's like, yeah, so sometimes you just, the most readily available option is to just knock it on the head. You know, just do what you're told, just quit. Mm. But uh, sometimes that's not always the best option, you know. You know, there's resilience to be found just chasing things like that and just find a way, make it work, you know. I have a friend I rolled with him last night. He had his hip replaced a couple of years ago. And he's like, oh, you know, I'm never going to be able to do jujitsu again. And he went off and got his hip replaced. But then about a year later, he's like, do you know what? This actually feels okay. This hip is moving okay. And now he's back doing jujitsu. And he's like, this is actually fine. It's working absolutely fine. Mm. No problems to him, you know? So it's good to see people like that. Just don't always take the the easy route or, the, you know, the, the most readily available route, you know? And you're not made of glass. Trust yourself, you know? None of us are getting out of here alive. You might as well have fun while you're here, you know? Exactly, you get you a few to, medals um, with it. Yeah, yeah. Get buried you, with it. Like. <laughs> you, you, you got to, uh, you got to have some enjoyable experiences along the way. Don't just settle into into you know nothingness and doing nothing in case this happens or in case that happens. You got to experiment in life. Get out there and enjoy yourself and and back yourself, you know, and and put yourself in testing situations and see can you can you come through them. It's really important. A lot of people just don't do that ever. I think that's what like if. Well, if I live a long life, I just want to like, I want people to know that I was relentless, mm. you know, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And then if, 
if I got that, then I'm happy. Well, you're doing something different here that a lot of people don't ever do. You know, they'd, they'd kind of just be daunted by the prospect of, you know, I'm going to go on camera and I'm just going to interview people and talk to people. And, mm. you know, a lot of people would, would would find that extremely intimidating. But you're backing yourself and you're doing it. And like, that's, like I said, that's that's massively important, you know. Yeah. It's, um if you want to do, if you want a life that's rich in experience, you know. That's don't, what you have to do. Don't just do the same thing that everybody else does that's going to be mind numbing. And just wear you down and then you're deeply unhappy 10 years later. You know, you got to, you got to find something that, that, that really lights your fire, you know. Because mm, this will catch up with you. Absolutely, you know, and that's, that's the, the, the key to long term uh, mental health. You know, we all have ups and downs, but if you have places that you really look forward to going to and you have people you really look forward to seeing, that really helps you get through this life, doesn't it? That's it. Mm. That's literally it. I fucking love this chat. I think we should leave it at that. What do you think, Paul? Sounds good to me imagine like i don't know we would have clapped hands in jujitsu before a thing there you go this bomb. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me nice one I thank really you for having me i fucking appreciate it i'm awesome. i really think that this like is the episode that will really help people out honestly hopefully i really appreciate it thank you so much for watching slash listening people thank you